Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Give us this day our daily bread. I was taking a Monday evening class at Lancaster Theological Seminary one semester a few years ago towards the end of my seminary education portion of formation and my Saturn, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> I can't even say it right, Saturn Ion Coop decided it would bite the dust. I was so proud of that vehicle. It was one of those cute little things where the doors had a half door in the back, you know, that little people could, you know, you could climb in next to, yeah, it was fun. I still get triggered and I try not to drive down that street where that repair shop is where they pulled my transmission out of my vehicle, made an analysis of it, and they ended up putting it back in my trunk. They put my transmission in my trunk. I said, you're not even going to hook it back up? <laughs> and they said, it's gone. They said, you need to call a tow truck for the junkyard. So one of the deals I made with God, have you ever done that let's make a deal thing with God? It's kind of one-sided. Was that my when I left my full-time career to enter seminary, that that Ion Coop was going to be my transportation for the four years of commuting all the way to Gettysburg, to Lancaster, to formation places. That was a deal, wink, wink, I made with God. It's like throwing out the fleece there. Yeah, if this thing works, then I'm going to be in seminary. So I borrowed Jeff's vehicle on that particular Monday evening, and I drove to Lancaster for the evening class. So much was on my mind. I made my way to the classroom where a couple of the students whom I had met over the course of the last couple of weeks were gathered. I was so discouraged. I told one of my new friends, well, this is it. I'm done. I'm done. My Saturn was supposed to get me through seminary. You know what this means. And my newfound friend, Harem, looked surprised at me, and he looked across the table at me in a way that Harem could only do, and he said, I tried to do the sideways eyeball that he gave me, and he said, do I know what this means? It means you're going to get another car. <laughs> Harem didn't toss a set of 
keys across the table to me, but he was a messenger from God that day, that he believed in what God was doing in my vocation and that God believed in me too. He was the angel of the Lord. And that God wasn't going to take no for an answer and that my GPS was just going to have to flash, recalculating, recalculating. He was that angel, <coughs> excuse me, that cooked up those hot cakes while I was hiding under the broom tree that day, like Elijah. Jesus is the bread of life. And we are the body of Christ. We are God's hands and feet in this world, serving up that nutrition. We're called to continuously point people to, to drive people to, to accompany people to the banquet feast. I'm often blessed to see the ways in which this congregation serves as a sanctuary for people who are hungry for God's wholeness. That angel of the Lord, good news, messenger, ministry comes in brand new ways that continue to shock me. One Saturday evening, a few years back, a visitor came to worship, sat in the back of the sanctuary. During the passing of the peace, I learned that he was a son of a former pastor here at St. Matthew, a pastor from the 50s and 60s. Do you know that we're only 20 years or so away from that being 100 years ago? Wow. He had grown up in this sanctuary, and he was in town for his father's funeral. I, I had known about his father's funeral. We chatted for some time in the sanctuary here after worship. The whole time he was looking around, I, I kind of knew what was going through his head because... You know, when you go back and revisit a place from your childhood, everything looks so small, right? He was trying to figure out what was new in here. He most likely envisioned the moments that he and his family had spent here. We chatted for some time, and actually we ended up going down into the basement, and he was the one, actually, who told me that in back in the day, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, that the basement didn't have those interior walls. There were not rooms down there. It was one wide open space. He talked about growing up in the Parsonage, which by the way is only one block up Grandview here on the corner. He was headed there next. That was the Parsonage, the old Parsonage that the church owned at one time. This was his pilgrimage back to the places where he was formed. He was giving thanks for these, this place where there was sanctuary. I wonder how many people have found sanctuary in this place in the past 75 years. I wonder how many people find sanctuary today. And I can look around at each and every one of you and I can find people who are finding sanctuary here. And how many will find sanctuary in the years to come? I thank God for all those places where I have been fed along the way by folks who probably don't even realize that they were involved in serving God food. Or by those who humbly smile from ear to ear in gratitude for what God has called them to. I encourage you today to take an inventory, to participate in a review of how you have been fed along the way. I think we've all been in these exercises before, and they're surprising results. We find memories, we find places where we were fed. And I encourage you to open your eyes wide to how the giving and receiving of God's bread of life can look much different than you would ever expect. Last week in our learning and loving sessions, we were introduced to Ahmad Faizi, who was fed and given sanctuary right across the street here in 2021 for a couple months. Ahmad lived the story for us. 
and continues to live the story of how important it is to have angels in our pathway trotting. And Ahmad continues to live out that story being one of those angels, a cultural navigator, an advocate, a lifesaver for those who are brand new to the community. Now, bread of life feeding is not always fun and games. Ask the angel who tried to feed Elijah, right? Elijah was not exactly the most willing participant in this get up and move on after you've eaten your pancakes. Let's move it. Elijah tried to hide under that broom tree again. And if you read the next chapter in 1 Kings, Elijah goes to this Mount Horeb and he tries to hide on the mountain in the cave. And it's God himself who comes to him that time and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? You had food for 40 days and 40 nights to move on. I guess the food has digested. You're hanging out here in the cave. Let's move on. Most people who need emergency bread of life feeding are not in a place of their own first choosing. There are new circumstances in life. There are new realities that place us in vulnerable positions. God's desire for us to seek wholeness pushes us out of comfort zones too. The same can be said of God's feeding of us in our non-emergent daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The Spirit of God leads us into uncomfortable places to move us into wholeness, into shalom. And often we are just like that dog that puts all four feet out and finds every little piece of the door frame when you want it to go out in the rain, right? Cats don't have that problem. Bread of life feeding is a continuous circle involving God and our neighbors and us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. When our relationship is right with God, it is right with our neighbor. When our relationship is right with our neighbor, it's right with our God. Open hands lead to giving and receiving. In this cycle of bread giving, we are going to be feeders and we're going to be receivers. One of the biggest Things that this congregation, and I'm going to look each one of you in the eye this morning. Yeah, I'm done with that side. One of the biggest things in this congregation to work on is the sin of not receiving help from others. Let me say that again. The sin of not receiving help from others. Weekly, weekly, I have conversations with people who refuse help from others within the congregation. Interestingly enough, people will receive help from others outside the congregation before they will help receive help from people within the congregation. And that doesn't sound like that cycle of feeding is happening in the congregation. And I have serious questions about that reality. Most of the time it's shrugged off and blamed on our culture. But remember that Jesus was countercultural. In the ways of the early church, the folks in Ephesus was extremely countercultural. Why? Because God has some serious bread feeding to do. God needs our help to break down those cultural barriers, one relationship at a time. 
I'm in this thing with you about not wanting to receive help as much as I want to give help. It's a very common thing. People are willing to give, 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 and not receive, receive, receive. And I've made some changes in my life along the way to be more aware of those angels that God has sent bearing gifts. I tried a little countercultural experiment in the elevator in the hospital one day recently. No, I was not one of those people that turns around in the elevator the wrong way, <laughs> stares at people. That is a fun experiment, though. When I'm wearing my collar in the hospital, on the street, in the grocery store, wherever it is, well, first of all, I get called father a lot. But there are reactions, various reactions from people in public. Sometimes there's a chatty conversation when I'm in the elevator at the hospital. It's a pretty fast elevator. Sometimes there's uncomfortable silence. One particular day, I ended up alone with a man for about three floors. We were going up, up, up. I personally or purposely did not break the silence on the way up. Because in all honesty, I leveled with myself and I was in a place where I needed to be fed in that moment. The elevator door opened and from my desired floor, apparently he had another floor to go. I stepped forward as the man continued to stare at the wall straight ahead and say nothing and on my way past him I spoke words that I often hear others speak to me on the way through the hallways or in the elevator or in the parking garage. I spoke shocking words from a collared clergy person. Please pray for me. I'm about to step into something that I don't know the outcome. My heart was heavy that day. I didn't know what I was going to find in the room that I stepped into. I had a brief moment of giggling to myself down the hallway at the irony of the situation. I kind of wondered what that man did after I left. This priest asked me to help him, to pray for him. Then I had peace. I had peace because I listened to God's constant prompting to hand the burden to an angel along the way. Now there are multiple levels in which we are called in our baptismal vocations, in my case, in my ordination vocation. On the elevator that day, I exercised that pushing of comfort level in the bread feeding. And today, I step forward in this congregation and beseech you to stop getting in the way of God's bread feeding. Open your hands and receive what your pewmates are offering. Again, I look at each and every one of you. I see gifts. I see glorious gifts beautiful gifts, angels out there. And I stop, and I add to that, stop getting in the way of God's bread feeding and open your hands and hearts and give and receive bread from those who have foreign accents. Yes, I'll name it. You run across somebody with a foreign Accent, and I'm not talking North Dakota or California or West Virginia. If somebody has a foreign accent, do not run away from them. They are a gift. Remember the little lesson we had a couple weeks ago about how our righteousness is an alien, comes from an alien source. The epistle writer tells us that we are to be imitators of God. 
the very grace that God has given us, we are to show that grace to others. If we trust the grace that God gives us, I don't see very many people say, oh, well, I don't need that salvation thing. Thank you. I appreciate it, God, but you know. No, we take it, don't we? We take God. Did you hear during the confession and forgiveness today? How that you are loved, you are forgiven. I don't know about you, but I felt good about that. I received those words. So if we trust the grace that God hands us, remember those hands, then we can trust the fingers of God's hands, our neighbors. We can trust our neighbors when they put their hands out. They're God's hands. I close with the Ephesians text. We be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. The sanctuary that God has provided for us, the bread from heaven that God has given to us through his only begotten son, we're to chew on that bread. And live out the very essence of that bread by feeding and being fed by others. To illustrate that today, we have some good chewy French bread today that Barb brought us. And last night in the service, it gave me great joy to be handed a great big hunk of that bread. And it took me a while to get through it too. And the whole time, I remembered something from those years. From those years when my car broke down. I remember some chapel services at the seminary where they really encouraged us to chew on that bread. And there were people that would go to the sacristy afterwards and they would chew on that bread even more. It was a gift. If we eat the bread of life, the bread of life should be distributed from our very lives. It will ooze out. Give us this day our daily bread. Make us instruments of your peace today. Amen.